So up to this point, we've taken a look at structured concurrency, a couple different models there. We've taken a look at modern Java concurrency and parallelism with a parallel streams example and a completable futures example. And then the third thing we're going to look at is a model that uses reactive programming, in particular the project reactor implementation. Once again, this uses IO bound tasks because it's doing exactly the same thing. It's downloading, transforming, and storing images in parallel. So now we're back in the EX4 project in my Loom folder in my Live Lessons GitHub repository. And this time we're going to take a look at the project reactor implementation of this code. And this implementation is kind of interesting because it kind of combines some features of parallel streams and kind of combines some features of completable futures into what's called a reactive programming model. Now, we will cover reactive programming quite a bit later in the course, so this is just a taste or a foreshadowing of what we'll do later. But I want you to see kind of how you can program this using one of the key data types, or there are actually two data types here, from Project Reactor. And the first one's called a flux. So it's like a flux reactor. All of you people who are physics majors know why that's a clever pun. So flux is a reactive type. It has a factory method that takes non-reactive types like a list of URLs and turns them into a reactive type. So we end up with a list of URLs being converted into a flux of URLs. You can think of a flux as a bit like a stream, but it's got more asynchrony than a normal stream does. We then convert that flux into a parallel flux. So that's a little bit like having a Java stream and then saying dot parallel and turning it into a parallel stream. So you can see the, the stream style influence. So now we have a parallel flux. And a parallel flux is a bit like a stream in that it's got a bunch of so-called rails, which are these threads internally that are going to be used to run things in parallel. And we instruct this parallel flux to use something called the bounded elastic thread pool model. And bounded elastic is like the common fork join pool combined with the managed blocker mechanism which will expand the number of threads in the pool if threads block. So it's bounded, because you can't have an infinite number of threads, but it's elastic and in the sense it can grow and uh, can contract. So once we've done that, then we can apply some operations. And these are going to look very familiar to you, because they look pretty much like what was in streams. We've got map and flat map. So map is going to call the download image method here. It's a behavior, it's a method reference. And Lo and behold, download image looks pretty much identical to what we had from the earlier assignment for download image for Java parallel streams, where we just download the content, make a new image, and return the image. So that could be completely reused. I don't think I reused it, but it could have been reused completely. We then take this parallel flux of um, image objects, and we are going to flat map them and then calling the transform image operator. And you can see what transform image does. It also looks a heck of a lot like Java parallel streams. We take the list of transforms and turn them into an iterable. We then convert that, sorry, we, we take the iterable list of transforms and turn it into a flux. We then turn the flux into a parallel flux, tell it to run on the bounded elastic scheduler, and then go ahead and transform the image using map. This is almost identical to the Parallel Streams version with just a few exceptions. Most notably, you have to do some extra ceremony in Project Reactor to convert uh, an iterable to a flux, tell it you want it to be parallel, and give it the scheduler to run on. So with Parallel Streams, you would just say um, you know, options.instance.transforms.stream or .parallel stream, boom, it's a parallel stream. This you have to do a few extra things, but the nice thing is you get to control what thread pool it uses, whereas with Java streams, you can't do that. Good question. So if you remember the parallel streams implementation, we couldn't use flat map in a similar way. We had to use this kind of map followed by reduce with stream concat. And the reason is because, for reasons I don't understand, the Java parallel streams implementation of flat map will limit inner parallelism to be sequential. It doesn't allow inner parallelism. And for whatever reason, a good reason probably, or a better reason, uh, Project Reactor allows that to happen. So Project Reactor's flat map doesn't have that weird uh, restriction that Parallel Streams does. So I actually like that aspect better. 
So transform image is going to return a, um, well, you can see what it returns here. It returns a parallel flux of images, one for every transform. And then flat map will flat map those things together. So we have a parallel flux of flattened images. And then the last thing we do here is we go ahead and store the images. And that just does the same. This is exactly the same call that we did with, with, uh, with Java parallel streams, literally exactly the same. So all those things were running in parallel. And then with parallel fluxes, you have to convert the parallel flux back into a flux when you want to join together the results of all that parallel processing. So dot sequential basically just gets the results back into one thread. And then we collect the results into a list. So collect list is kind of like to list. So now we have a list of, uh, of images. And then we block, which is kind of like join. And it says, wait until everything's done. And then we take the results and print them out. So that is the parallel flux or project reactor implementation of this. And depending on your point of view, this is roughly the same amount of complexity as parallel streams. There's a little bit more stuff you have to do here. But as I said, the nice thing about this with parallel fluxes and with project reactors, you can control what thread pool is used. Whereas with parallel streams, you're kind of limited unless you really do strange things to the common fork join pool. So this gives you a bit more flexibility. But it's about the same amount of code, and we don't have that weird flat map limitation. So I kind of like it better. So just for kicks, let's go ahead and run these tests. And uh, this time, I will just let them run. And you can see how long they take to run. So you can see when the program starts up, it indicates how many cores we have available. That's a, a call that you make to the Java runtime environment. And it basically says, uh, I've got 10 cores available. And what's interesting about Apple computers, unlike most computers based on Intel chips, the Intel chips have so-called hyper-threaded cores. So if you have eight cores, it'll show up as 16 cores. But you actually have eight hyper-threaded cores. And a hyper-threaded core isn't quite the same thing as a real core. Uh, it basically allows, hyper-threading allows essentially superscalar processing of certain operations. But it doesn't always give you as much of a speed up as a true core does. So my Mac, this has the, I think it's the uh, is it M1 Pro chip. And so it's got a lot of horsepower, 64 megabytes of memory. So you can see this thing is chunking away. Uh, every time something finishes, it prints out how many images it downloaded, transformed, and stored. And uh, I think you can see there's some 30, probably 31 or 32, some images. And this is the result of all that processing. Once again, Completable Futures executes the fastest, followed by structured concurrency. And for some reason, poor project reactor implementation finishes in the last place. Um, sometimes it runs very well. For this particular workload, it didn't for whatever reason. I'm not quite sure why. But um, you know, these things will change as, as implementations improve and if you run on different hardware and so on. So that's the end of that example.